Bob, it's great to see you. Uh, I checked uh, the last time we spoke was uh, in Boston. Uh, it was October of 2011. So we're heading up on our decade. And I'm really fascinated to see what has happened in, in sleep and dream research since I enjoyed our conversation then. And I have to tell you, I loved your book, uh, When Brains Dream, Exploring the Science and Mystery of Sleep. Uh, unfortunately, I have uh, missed a lot of sleep because I, uh, I was reading it the last few days. But how long have you been working on the book? Well, Tony Zadra and I, uh, we've been working on it. It probably started about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, nowadays with the publishing industry, they want they want copy edited version almost a year before they go to press. So the book was really done almost a full year ago. But we spent we spent a full year and a half writing it as well. Good. So what I'd like to do is I you know have this book in, embedded in me, and it's hard to be able to organize it. But let's let's try to do it in a in a systematic way, and we're going to focus on dreams for sure. Uh, but let's start with the milieu in which dreams take place. And then first of all, talk about sleep. So uh, let's start with kind of the basic stuff about the stages of sleep and particularly what have we learned about them in recent years? Sure. So while it might feel like when you're asleep, you're just asleep, you're actually going through a series of different sleep stages. It's about a 90 minute cycle you start with waking and then you go into deeper and deeper sleep for about a half hour, 45 minutes. And then your sleep starts to lighten and you come up to lighter sleep. And after about 90 minutes, you go into what we call REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the state where our dreams are most intense, most bizarre, most visual, most emotional. And we stay in REM sleep and then we cycle down again. And we have this 90 minute cycle all night long where we're going in and out of REM sleep into deeper non-REM sleep up into REM sleep. And as the night progresses, we spend less of each cycle in that deep non-REM sleep and more of it in REM. So while we've got this 90 minute cycle, it's really marching towards more and more REM sleep. Um, they differ in a number of ways. They differ physiologically in terms of the brain activity. Um, if you're recording the EEG from the scalp, measuring the brain activity, you see these waves of oscillating activity in, in occurring in the brain, which are very slow uh, when you're in non-REM sleep and then get faster and faster until you're in REM sleep where you actually can't even see them anymore. So the brain becomes much more desynchronized, looks more like when we're awake, when we're in REM sleep. Um, other things change as well. There's a lot of neuromodulators in the brain. There's noradrenaline, there's serotonin, there's acetylcholine and dopamine, uh, which really sort of run the program that's being implemented in your brain at any given moment. It's the same hardware all the time. But these neuromodulators sort of say, are we being focused? Are we letting our attention wander, uh, what's going on. And those change from, from sleep stage to sleep stage so that when you go into REM sleep, the release of serotonin and the release of norepinephrine, and noradrenaline is completely shut off. So you go into a very different neurochemical milieu where only the acetylcholine seems to be high. And so that seems to help us process memories more effectively. So roughly in a given night's sleep, what percentage of time are we in REM? So we spend about 20% of the night in REM sleep. Children spend more, infants spend hugely more, up to two thirds of their night in REM. But basically once we hit adolescence, we're spending 20% of our night in REM, 20% in the deeper stages of non-REM sleep, and a full 60% in sort of light non-REM sleep. Okay, of the non-REM sleep, um, uh, which is 80%, 20% deep, 60%, uh, you've divided into what you call N1, N2, and N3, different stages. And, and they're more than just um, uh, specified, that there are different physiological functions. Uh, how deep can we understand those differences? The, the difference, well, first of all, the three stages, the division between those three stages is somewhat arbitrary. REM sleep is a, is a qualitatively different state of sleep than non-REM. 
and we sort of draw lines um, between the different stages of non-REM depending on how much of the time uh, in any given minute we spend with really slow oscillations in the brain. Uh, we don't know a lot about the function of these different stages. We know that uh, children growing up release most of their growth hormone during N3, the, the deepest stage of, of non-REM sleep. And, and we know that for memory processing during the night, um, a lot of our processing of, of facts that we learn during the day, um, that that information tends to be strengthened and, and solidified during N3 sleep or other types of, of learning, like procedural learning of how to do things or motor tasks or visual tasks tend to be more correlated with the amount of time we spend in N2 sleep. Mm. N1 only comes on as we're just falling asleep and it's only two or three minutes long. Yeah. And when we talk about dream function, we can come back and talk about what N1 is doing. Okay. All right, let's uh, go into now, we know the stages of, of sleep. Let's go into the physiological um, purposes of sleep. Uh, when people first started uh, thinking about sleep, uh, they just thought it was just rest. Uh, but as we've learned more, there are some very distinct physiological uh, activities going on. So let's articulate those and then we'll go on to dreams. Okay. so. Physiological functions of sleep. What you call we, housekeeping. Housekeeping. We, <laughs> housekeeping. <laughs> so some of them, some of them are housekeeping. It turns out that uh, we do a lot of processing uh, of immunological uh, systems, of hormonal systems. So we know, for example, and this is particularly relevant in the COVID era that if we sleep the private subject after they've received say an influenza vaccination and then look at how much antibody they're producing two weeks later, it's reduced 50% if they don't sleep the night after they receive the vaccination. Wow. Wow. So you really need that sleep afterwards and you need it before too. They get the same sorts of results. If they just restrict people to four hours of sleep a night, for four or five nights before the immunization. Again, you get almost a 50% reduction in how much antibody you produce. And that's really the difference in many cases between being functionally immunized and not. Yeah, I've had the experience in life where if I feel like I'm getting sick or getting cold uh, and I go to sleep and, and sleep a long time, in many cases, not all, I can avoid that. And you know, I've always wondered, is, is that a wives tale or psychosomatic? But it might be psychosomatic, not in the placebo sense, but in the real sense of your mind really affecting how antibodies are, are formed. Yes, and it's, we don't know what that mechanism is. We don't know how sleep is enhancing that, but it clearly does, and of course, as everybody knows if they stop and think about it, when you get a cold, there is this overwhelming drive um, to sleep. And in fact, one of the best known somnogens, uh, chemical substances that can tend to push you into sleep is the breakdown products of bacterial cell walls. Mm. So if you get a bacterial infection, your brain notices that and it tries to get you to sleep more. So. Not only is it helpful, but your brain knows that and tries to push you into that state. You've also talked about uh, growth hormone being um, amplified during sleep. And in fact, you, you have some statistic with just a, in children, very large growth can occur measurable in, in just one or two nights. Is that right? You can grow close to a quarter of an inch overnight. That's unbelievable. That can, you know, when they first came up with this measurement, and it was a nurse who did it because the doctors all thought they knew better, but she actually saw kids a lot. Yeah. Um, when they stopped to think about it, if you take each spinal segment, each spinal bone, there's a growth plate at the top and the bottom of that segment, that spinal segment. And if each of those growth plates does one cell division, gets one cell thicker, mm. and you do that for the whole length of your spine, it's somewhere between an eighth and a quarter of the inch, and of an inch. And so, yes, when 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 parents say to their kids, "You're bigger than you were yesterday," 
<laughs> that can literally be true. Wow, that, that's amazing. Uh, and, what else? and something like 80% of that growth hormone that's driving that cell division, that growth, is released during um, those stages, those times when you're in that deepest M3 sleep. Mm. And so it's differentiated even between the 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 different um, segments of non-REM sleep, not just between REM sleep and non-REM sleep. That's right. That's right. It's that deep M3 sleep that seems to be pushing the release of growth hormone. How about the physiological process of uh, memory consolidation? Ah, well, that's you know that's my that, that's my my life story. That's my life work now. Um, it turns out that the entire time we're asleep, our brain is processing the memories from our day. What I like to tell people is that evolution has calculated that for every two hours we spend awake taking in new information, it has to go offline for an hour. So it can just step back and look at that information and figure out, if you will, what it means. It's very easy to record something. It's very hard to figure out whether it's worth keeping, how it should be kept, where it should be stored, and in essence, what it means. And that's what the brain is doing all night long. It's taking memories and stabilizing them. It's making them stronger so that you can, for example, do some task you learned the night before faster, more efficiently in the morning than you could in the evening before you went to bed. It'll take an emotional memory and strip out all the background images in the scene and just hold the memory for the emotional core of that event. If you're taking in a lot of related information, it will take that information and it'll look for patterns. It'll extract gist from it. It can hold on to the gist and forget the detail. Or if there is some sort of pattern in the data, it can discover that or the rules that control it. All of this is happening while we sleep. And much of this, it doesn't seem to be able to do while we're awake. That sounds like a great story, but uh, you know, as a former neuroscientist myself, I've, I've got to ask you, give me an experimental design that can back up what you just said. Okay, let's take a simple task. Typing with your left hand up on the keys, the sequence four, one, three, two, four. Okay. It's sort of an ugly sequence that goes back and forth. We'll have a subject type that as quickly and accurately as they can for 30 seconds. Rest for 30 seconds. Do it again for a total of 12 repetitions. Most people, especially if you take like college students, they'll start off somewhere around 18. In the first 30 seconds, they'll type it successfully 18 times. Then after just three or four trials, they'll be up around 23 or 24. And at the end of the 12, they will plateau maybe at 26. We do that in the morning. We say, thanks, see you later. We send them home. They come back that evening, 12 hours later. We sit them down. They have, we have them do just two 30 second trials. And where are they? They're at 24, right where they ended when they finished training that morning. If we flip the time scale, if we train them in the evening, they still start at 16. They still train up to about 24 at the end. They come back the next morning, and right off the bat, they're 15 to 20% faster. Wow. Okay. Now, maybe that's not sleep. Maybe that has to do with just the night. But we can repeat this in a nap paradigm. We can train them at 10 in the morning, test them at three in the afternoon, and give half of them a 90 minute nap. And the ones that get the 90 minute nap will again be 15 to 20% faster at 3 p.m. The ones who don't nap will be exactly where they were at the end of training. And if we look at the sleep, especially with the overnight study, we'll find that the amount of time they spend in N2 sleep late in the night is highly predictive of the overnight improvement. In fact, it explains 50% of the variance and how much improvement people show. Okay, uh, just to finalize the physiological benefits of, of sleep, uh, you've also talked about the uh, kind of the cleansing of the brain from 
uh, beta amyloid proteins, which could be cause of uh, Alzheimer's uh, and other kinds of things by the cerebral cort cortical fluid kind of bathing that. Is that, is that a, a, a kind of a generalization or do you know that? No, we now know that and there's been more and more studies replicating that and we're really confident now. While you're sleeping, the cells in the brain actually shrink a little bit. Um, and when they do that, they open up a lot more space around them. Okay. And that allows the cerebral spinal fluid, which really bathes all the cells uh, in the brain and the spinal cord, it gives it a lot more room and you get more motion uh, of that fluid. And the studies have been done and show that you get actual washing out of these beta amyloid complexes that are indeed um, hypothesized to be a major contributor to the development of Alzheimer's disease. And my might that mean because I spent so much time reading your book and learning so much that I have a higher percentage of maybe getting Alzheimer's because I missed sleep the last couple of nights? Not a couple of nights, no. If you read kidding. my book compellingly every night for the next five years, <laughs> that might do it. Okay, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> but, but it's been shown that your amyloid content will be lower in the morning than it was the night before, if and only if you slept. And there's now a study out uh, that came out in science, I think almost two years ago now, that shows that that increased flow happens during slow wave sleep. Mm. And it actually happens in a pulsatile way that's timed to the actual slow oscillation. So these slow oscillations are going at about 0.5 to 1 per second. So they, la they take about one or two seconds to happen. And you can actually, in fMRI, see the pulses lining up with that actual uh, oh. electrical activity in the brain. So the brain is pumping it out. Another important function we're discovering for sleep is that it seems to be involved in the regulation of insulin. When people are sleep deprived for a couple of nights or put on four hours of sleep a night for four or five nights, they start to look pre-diabetic. Their regulation of insulin goes off and it leads to um, an increase in weight. Uh, it leads to more eating because the insulin regulation is off. And Ed Van Cotter at the University of Chicago has hypothesized that in fact much of the epidemic of obesity that we have, not just in the US, but around the world, is not just caused by um, the food we're eating, but the lack of sleep that we're slowly building up. We know that uh, when animals are sleep deprived, they will die probably sooner than they would be by food de uh, 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 um, depletion. Um, and there are, you know, world records of humans uh, staying awake for 11 days or whatever, but that Guinness Book of Records I read in your book has been canceled because that's really dangerous. Um, so how, how do you, uh, what are the, the drivers that if we are significantly sleep depri deprived, we can actually die? We don't know the answer to that question. And it's a fascinating one because it's been probably close to 40 to 50 years since it was first really cleanly shown with rats that if they are sleep deprived, they will die, all of them, within one to two weeks. And they've spent 40 to 50 years trying to figure out why they die. And we don't know. Mm. They tend to get uh, infections. It might be some kind of sepsis, but that doesn't seem to be able to explain it all. Mm. So it really is one of those remaining mysteries of sleep. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.